Beloved by God Church, let us begin our service before the Lord. Let us stand up and confirm the confession of the faith of our heart, the, pl- the promise that belongs to the door of our hope. May the resurrection of Christ reign within our bodies. Amen. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are grateful to your holy name for the great privilege of being in this place that your hand has appointed for the worshiping of your holy name. Now allow your inheritance in the name of the blood of the covenant to be lifted to heights that are not reachable for us and destroy all burden and sin that binds us. May in this service as previously all the works of devil be cursed, illnesses, poverty, untimely death, demonic possession, all matter of fear, depression, destruction, ignorance, and error, all of this may depart from the tents of your holy people. Now stand, O Lord, upon the place of your rest, you and the ark of your might, and may your saints be clothed into your salvation and rejoice before your face. Give us more of your Spirit, saturate us with your Holy Spirit, allow us to find your great face. We thank you that the service is presented by Apostle Arkady into your godly hands, and we pray continue to lead it with a mighty and powerful arm, our great God, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. May you be blessed. Please be seated. The Book of Apostle Paul, Hebrews 11.5 By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. The theme of the sermon, To Please God. Studying this unique in its significance place of scripture, we have noted, Apostle Arkady writes, that Enoch, who is mentioned in this verse, although he belongs to the exemplary pleiad of heroes of faith, in this particular verse, Enoch stands uniquely apart from the rest of the other heroes of faith. Because unlike Enoch, here is what the scriptures say about the rest of the heroes of faith. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Hebrews 11.13 About Enoch, it is written that he, ha- he was taken away, he did not see death, and he was not because God had taken him. Therefore, Within the meaning that is contained in this verse, we see presented a revelation of a unique in its nature promise, called to destroy within the mind of a Christian person the false strongholds of salvation, which within the span of 2,000 years, due to the ignorance of carnal leaders, have perverted the truth about the kingdom of heaven, turning it from news of salvation into a deadly deception. And so, why are we given this promise? One of its functions, purposes, is to destroy within the mind of a Christian person the false strongholds of salvation. And so, looking at the statement, we see that the Lord will not be able to erect the stronghold of life and resurrection in the place of the stronghold of death if He first will not destroy something in our mind. And this is, that was laid by carnal leaders as a a basis within the mind. And unfortunately, they have turned, as Apostle Arkady writes, uh, this news of salvation into a deadly deception. Let us shortly remember these false strongholds of salvation that we need to destroy and that we need to become free of so that the Lord will be able to establish His promises for our body. Because if this victory does not occur in our soul, then our body will not have any victory. And so, false strongholds that are in the mind of Christian people. We are familiar with many of them. Some we have become free of, free of uh, very recently, and some we are be- becoming free of today. First, false strongholds of salvation built or established within the mind of carnal men is a false assurance or confidence of your salvation which they received into their heart in the format of a guarantee as a personal possession. People receive salvation as a possession. 
But Brother Kadi says it's given as a guarantee temporarily in the form of a seed that needs to be grown. A person receives salvation in the seed in the format of a guarantee, but if he has not grown the seed of just uh, of justification into the fruits of righteousness, he will never be able to walk before God and consequently will never be able to please God, due to which we, he will be required to share the lake of fire with those like him and with the devil and his angels. And so we confirm for ourselves, we, instead of uh, establishing this foundation of false salvation, we establish true salvation, we, from the format of justification, we grow the fruit of righteousness, the character of Christ. And this is necessary to happen. People think that God has done everything 2,000 years ago because he said it has it was finished. When he said it was finished means that he had finished everything from his side. In the book of Revelation, the Lord said again uh, that it is finished. When? When he saw the church, when he saw Jerusalem, when he saw those who were victorious, he said, it is finished. These people had done something. They finished their part. That very individual who, who spoke from the cross said it for a second time when he saw the bride, uh, it is finished. The one who overcomes will inherit. There was also another word he had said. When the great Babylon fell and from the temple, the church of God, the from the throne of God had stated it is finished the lord through his church where he has est- where he has established his salvation he had finished and will continue to complete will finish will achieve his goal and so salvation we receive in the format of a guarantee and to receive it as your possession you need to turn it so that it can profit you so that you can receive it in f- in the form of fruit Second, false strongholds of salvation consist in many saints being caught in a snare or in a trap of the evil one due to their inability to forgive one another before the setting of the sun, due to which their personal sins will not be forgiven by God, however much they may confess them. How unfortunate is this? However much a person confesses his sins, his sins will not be forgiven. Because he is not forgiving, they are not able to forget their brother or sister. A person not capable of forgiving his neighbor is not able to walk before God and consequently is not able to please God, due to which will be required to share the lake of fire with those like them and with the the devil and his angels. Third false strongholds of salvation consist in the fact that many who are born from the seed of the word of truth perceive the false strongholds of salvation established in their body as the temple of the Holy Spirit when in actuality, in the better circumstance, This is a Jewish synagogue, and in the worst circumstance, this is a synagogue of Satan. A person who has not built his body into the temple of the Holy Spirit is not able to walk before God, and consequently is not able to please God, due to which he will be required to share the lake of fire with those like him, and with the devil and his angels. And so, people are immediately convinced, as soon as they believe in the Lord, that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The scriptures say for us to be the temple of the Holy Spirit, Christ needs to be there, and Christ is only there or will come in when we receive the right to die by the law to the law. So it is no longer I who live, but Christ in me. And so when people were convinced of this, they started considering themselves as the Holy Spirit and as God and, and as the Holy Spirit and who is sitting on our throne is our I, our our arrogant intellect is sitting on the throne. And so this stronghold uh, needs to be removed. When You need to explain to a person that when you're born again, you are synagogue of the Jewish synagogue. These are people that in their carnal state are not able to uh, compare spiritual things with spiritual things, and they need someone to be able to teach them so they can understand and comprehend the erm and the thummim in their life, and they're not able to seal any of this yet and so the difference between a jewish synagogue and the synagogue of satan is that a jewish synagogue is able to be renewed with repentance and can uh, you can renew your mind the synagogue of satan it's not possible to be renewed with repentance because nobody is an authority for these people this person is at the brink of death and they uh even at the the 
the end of their life. They do not want even to see a pastor. They don't want anyone uh, and are not willing to see anyone. A person is not able to be renewed with repentance. They don't acknowledge anyone. Every day this person reads the Bible. But when you tell a person, can I explain to you what this means? They'll say, you don't need to teach me. You don't need to teach me. And you, you try to tell them, well, you're not understanding that correctly. And so, unfortunately, the elderly woman, she was always convinced of this, that she was always reading the Bible every day, but when uh, the anointed tried to explain something to her, she continually rejected it and refused it. Fourth, false strongholds of salvation consist in the fact that many Christians who are baptized by the Holy Spirit perceive the baptism of the Holy Spirit as the leadership of the Holy Spirit and identify the act of baptism of the Holy Spirit as them being family with God. A person not possessing the ability in himself to be led by the Holy Spirit and a person perceiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit as the leadership of the Holy Spirit is not able to walk before God and consequently is not able to please God, due to which he will be required to share the lake of fire with those like him and with the devil and his angels. And so baptism of baptism or being uh, speaking in tongues or being baptized and speaking in tongues doesn't mean you're a family with God yet. Uh, this needs to be confirmed, this baptism of water. Uh, if you're baptized in water, you need to confirm these things because being born again, being born from God is determined by one standard. This is being born from the truth of the seed of the word. The Lord sends a person into your life. Uh, this person tells the truth, and if it's rejected, because some people think if they've been baptized uh, in water, and especially if they can speak in tongues, they're guaranteed salvation, they're children of God. But our fam being, us being family with God is determined by us being born from the seed of the word of truth. How do we react to the truth? How do we react to the person giving us the truth? How do we react uh, to the congregation, the church, where the truth is being spoken? And by this, the Lord will determine whether he is family with this person. Many people followed Jesus Christ and many abandoned him. And the apostles were disappointed, saying, you know, they all left you. And he, Jesus said, don't worry, th these are trees that my Heavenly Father did not plant. Jesus determined people in one way. They needed to be born from the truth. The fact that he's just dipped in water, or if a Jew says, I'm a Jew, I'm, I'm a Jew, uh, my my ancestors were Jews. Unfortunately, this circum that circumcision is not circumcision because the Lord determines these things, again, by how you react to His truth, which He has magnified in His temple and we magnify also within our body. Fifth, false strongholds of salvation consist in man thinking that he is worshiping in spirit and in truth when he prays in tongues. A person not possessing the ability to worship in spirit and in truth and perceiving the speaking of tongues as worshiping in spirit and in truth is not able to walk with God and consequently is not able to please God due to which he will be required to share the lake of fire with those like him and with the devil and his angels. And so to worship in spirit and in truth, it's not necessary to speak in tongues. It can be present there, but this is not the parameters by which you can determine that you're worshiping in spirit and in truth. To worship in spirit and in truth, first, the Lord says, find a place where there's a remembrance for my name. Second, you need to have an organic membership to this place. And from this position, from this place, when you're taught the statutes, you with bold boldness will speak the word, the, you pray uh, the word. This is praying in spirit and in truth. That is now the possession of your heart. Sixth, false strongholds of salvation consist in men of carnal ignorance of the truth, convincing other men that God has loved the whole world, when in fact God only loved each one that believes in the world, regardless of tongue, nation, or tribe. They say God loved everybody. Pastor Arkady says, God has loved everyone who believes. 
regardless of the tongue, nation, or tribe, everyone who believes. A person being convinced that God equally loves both the righteous and the wicked, and that he gave his son for the one as well as the other, cannot walk with God, and furthermore, cannot please God, due to which he will be required to share the lake of fire with those like him as well as with the devil and his angels. Seventh, false strongholds of salvation consist in us being convinced that from the time we are born again, by hearing the word of truth, in the format of the seed of the preached to us word of truth, that Christ lives within us from this time, moment on. A person who in the death of the Lord Jesus has not died through the law, to the law, is not able to be crucified with Christ, and therefore Christ is not in any way able to live in the heart of such a person. We therefore conclude that such a person cannot walk with God and cannot please God, due to which he will be required to share the lake of fire with those like him, as well as with the devil and his angels. And so again, when Christ lives in us, when we die by the law, to the law, and we say that it is not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Eighth, false strongholds of salvation consist in us trusting that being born from God gives us the right to live under under grace immediately. A person in whose heart grace does not reign by the grown by him fruit of righteousness from the seed of justification is not able to walk with God and furthermore is not able to please God. There's a difference between being under grace and to receive something because of grace. And so being under grace is the process of your entire life. You need to grow the fruit of righteousness so that uh, through righteousness, grace can reign. We receive justification freely by grace, by grace. But we say we want to be under grace. To be under grace, we need to receive something first by grace. And when we receive according to God's will, we correctly receive by grace. We receive it in the format of a seed. And if you want to be under this grace, you need to magnify grace within your life. And this is only through the root uh, uh, fruits of righteousness, the character of Christ that has grown within you. We receive this fruit of this this grace so we can then be under it. Ninth, false strongholds of salvation consists in us trusting that being born from hearing the preached to us word of truth, that at this moment God has made us kings and priests to God. God does not make us uh, just make you kings and priests. He and he he. This only happens. This occurs as a collaborative effort. He with you together uh, need to make make you into a king and a priest. We can conclude that a person who has not built himself into a spiritual house with other precious stones is not able to walk with God, and furthermore cannot please God. He does not just make you a king and a priest. He has built you into that w- as a collaborative effort. Uh, we need to collaborate with God and to collaborate with God. The Lord immediately uh, wants to have a relationship, and He wants us to have a relationship with His children, with other precious stones, by which uh, He will use these stones to, to build up His temple. And we collaborate with God, and as we see collaborating with God, is determined how we collaborate with one another. And so if I say I collaborate with God, but with all you, I, I have conflicts with all of you, and I'm a very argumentative then we are not collaborating with anyone. A person cl- who collaborates with God, he will never uh, try to have conflicts in the church and arguments. Tenth, false strongholds of salvation consist in us thinking that all the written word of God in the Holy Scriptures is rhema, opened and understood for the reasonable abilities of our soul. It is actually logos. A person who has the audacity to interpret the thoughts of God with his own mind, independent of the place by God apostles and prophets, is not able to walk with God and furthermore is not able to please God. And so we acknowledge that the word of God, the Holy Scriptures, this is Logos. This is Logos. Because I look into the book and I don't know what I'm seeing. I'm seeing what I should, I'm, I'm not supposed to see, for example. It's supposed to be something different. This is Rama right here. 
Rama is a living person has explained this to me, a living apostle. And if I did not understand something, I can approach him and ask him, can you please explain this? And he will explain it. This is the word that the Lord can explain that uh, can be used to correct me, to instruct me, to uh, give me information for the future. Uh, This is when the Lord speaks to us using his lips. He will make it that in his church will be his person who will represent his fathership. He will make him his lips. And all the saints then will be like-minded and of one accord. These ten strongholds are strongholds we need to destroy, the strongholds of false salvation, so that in their place you can establish true salvation. And when the strongholds of true salvation are established, then will we be able to trust that upon the place uh, where I am, the stronghold of life will be erected in the place of the strong of the stronghold of death. Therefore, after we erect our Methuselah in the form of the grown by us fruit of righteousness, in the place of the destroyed by us false strongholds of salvation, God intends to change or transform our earthly bodies bodies into the image of heavenly bodies, so that like Enoch, he can move us to heaven and allow us to avoid death expecting all mankind. In this way, to give us the right to the power to clothe ourselves into our heavenly home in the form of our new imperishable body. Therefore, in its entirety, this unique promise is called to be revealed to those who fear God, who made it to these last times by obeying their faith to the faith of God, presented in Scripture in the preached words of the apostles and prophets, who are called by the Holy Spirit to be the lips of God and carriers of the seed of the word. And relevant to this, we already studied three questions. First question, what do we need to do to receive the right and ability to walk with God so that we can please God and receive a living testimony in the form of our imperishable body? Question two, what criteria and characteristics do the scriptures provide for the completeness or the fullness of our pure, imperishable, and unsearchable inheritance that is in Jesus Christ? Question three, the price we need to pay to collaborate our faith with the faith of God so that in this way we can please God and question four that we are studying today by what results can we examine ourselves as to whether we are in the faith as to whether we walk with God and so let us together study one very significant element contained in the result which is able to be examined by our ability to not be disappointed if our prayer for for help is delayed or held up in its path, and be prepared for any scenario, both in timing as well as method, that God has prepared for our own good. And so we need to demonstrate our faith in our ability to not be disappointed. This is one of the results of us walking before God, so that we can be moved We can be moved to heaven and bypass death that expects all men. We need to not have disappointment. And as Pastor says, especially when our response is being held up and we need to be ready for any scenario and not explain to God what He should be doing or how we see it. Let's read this interesting parable, Luke 18, 1 through through 8. Then he spoke a parable to them, that men always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him, saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? 
When the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth as this widow had? There are a lot of individuals here, and we touched upon it a little bit in the last serv- sermon, and Pastor dedicated uh, a sufficient amount of time to explain the anatomy of our tongue, because in this parable we see the three individuals, the widow, the adversary, and the unjust judge. The unjust judge is our tongue, and our tongue <clears throat> needs to have the calling of a judge and unjust is not necessarily only bad there's a very interesting meaning in this word not every person uh, has a tongue that is a judge and Apostle Arkady has dedicated a lot of time to show how we need to behave so that our tongue become a judge He had said that the fire by which uh, our tongue is ignited will be the same fire uh, of our future and also our atmosphere of our future and our home. And so a tongue that is inflamed by the Holy Spirit that is within my spirit, then of course my eternity will be with the Lord. And so who is the author of this flame, hell or the Holy Spirit? And so let us see how our tongue is ignited or inflamed from the positive angle. In scripture it says that our tongue is ignited and the way it is ignited it's an entire process according to this place of scripture and other places the fire of the Holy Spirit within the wise and good heart of man becomes a fire of life of his new man the fire of the Holy Spirit again that is within a wise heart of a Christian person becomes a fire of eternal life of the new man and from this fire the thoughts of a holy person are ignited. Our soul is ignited, and the fire of our thoughts, in turn, then inflames or ignites our gentle tongue that will, as a result, a, a throne of judgment. And, and, and this will be the meek tongue that will be then the... In Daniel, it's written in the seventh chapter that finally I, I had seen what that the thrones were... were Placed and the judges were seated and the books were opened. And so when the Lord will uh, place his white throne and he will be judging the angels and the, and the people, he will judge with his church, the church that today already, already has occupied its place. We have the option to stand before the throne with our head down or to be seated with him and be a judge. And for this, it's necessary, as Pastor says, that our lips would be ignited by the Holy Spirit, but they will not be ignited if our soul, if our mind is not first ignited, and it will not be ignited if our the Holy Spirit is not within, within our heart with His revelations. And so we see how the power of the Holy Spirit then reaches our tongue, through our from the our spirit to the soul, and from the soul, it. Uh, our tongue is ignited and our tongue then can pray before the Lord. Uh, Brother Kadi has uh, explained the, very well to us that how our tongue becomes a judge, how important this judge is for us that we will be talking about. He dedicated a, a lot of material, a lot of time to this, what is necessary to be done so that our tongue could become a judge. And so we'll come back to this parable that we read. If you paid attention, all of the individuals of this parable, 
This includes the widow, her adversary wanting her land and the possession of her deceased husband, and the unjust judge who avenged her against her adversary all live in one city. This widow represents the image of a holy person with a broken heart in the face of her deceased husband, who symbolically represents our new man. As it is written, Matthew 5, 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. People that are poor in spirit are people who are broken in heart, who inherit the kingdom of heaven, who are broken in heart, broken in spirit. People who are broken in spirit are people who have a circumcised heart, who humbly accept any adversities or turns of fate from God, allowing God to decide to decide the time to heal them and to protect them, and in this way to completely trust upon the providence of God without rebellion and humbly overcoming the trials that befall their lot, considering it a great privilege. And so who are these people with a broken spirit or broken heart? They accept voluntarily they accept the adverse adversities that come that come again come at them uh, or the turns of fate that come up, that come at them returning to the given parable we find that in the same city where the widow lived her adversary also lived who made himself known as it strange as it is after the death of her husband by desiring her land and possessions originally belonging to the husband of this widow and this adversary turned out to be none other than the old man, the old husband of the widow, the old husband of the soul, who previously ruled over our land and our possessions in the form of our body and our soul. When we die in the death of the Lord Jesus for our nation, for the house of our Father, who resists the truth, and for the carnal whims of our soul, then we, in the resurrection of Christ, demonstrate the fruit of righteousness grown by us in the death of the Lord Jesus. And when we have grown the fruit of righteousness in the form of the born to us Methuselah from the seed of the received by us justification, our husband in the form of the old man is abolished from power over our earth and over our possessions in the form of our body and our soul. And so, again, when power is taken away from our earth over our possessions, our body and our soul, when is this power abolished? When is this power taken from him? When our soul dies in the death of the Lord Jesus. We die by the law to the law. And then this bond the, her marital bond is then broken with him, with the old man, and she now has the right to marry another. Becoming free from the power of the old man and the death of the Lord Jesus, our soul now becomes the legitimate wife of the new man in the form of the born to us Methuselah, who has started demonstrating the power of the new man as our husband over our body and our soul. And so our new man represents the power of Christ within us. And this is possible when our soul is freed from the power of the old man, where in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, it turns out that our soul needs to uh, be submerged into death and experience death, the three institutions of power that connect us with our old man. This is our nation, the house of our father, who resists the truth and our personal carnal desires. So these three institutions they give the old man the right to have a legitimate relationship or have power over our soul and our land, our body. But in, when in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ we die, our soul now becomes a widow and now has the right to marry the new man. In this new man we see, of course, Jesus Christ. But while the husband is alive, any relationship with another man is, of course, a sin and so until she, while the wife is is connected to her husband mar, uh, has marital bond with with the old man 
then she cannot uh, have a relationship with another. And so again, any kind of activity uh, from her end with another man will be considered a sin until this contract is broken. And Jesus, of course, will not will not have this if you're still married to the old man and trying to uh, please him also. But when we're freed from the power of the old man and the death of the Lord Jesus, then we become the legal wife of the new man or Jesus Christ. But when our Methuselah in the form of our new man representing our spirit having been grown into the full measure of growth in Christ has humbled and broken itself before God, our soul in the form of the reasonable aspect of our soul, renewed by the spirit of our mind, becomes widowed. And so now our soul for the second time becomes a widow. When? When our spirit that has been grown into the full measure of growth, when our spirit is an infant, it can't humble itself. It needs to be humbled. But when our s- spirit has grown into the into into fullness, in the fullness of the growth of Christ, and our soul becomes widow, <clears throat> because our spirit voluntarily we break it, we humble ourselves before God. There's a method or time when the Lord humbles a person, and there's a time when a person corrects and humbles himself. And there's also when a person has humbled himself completely, and the Lord then humbles the one that is humble. As it talked about Prophet Daniel, and you allowed your me you allowed you who is already technically humble to be humbled again. You're humbling the humbled one. At this time, you are breaking that person. That's that's, and so when a person is born, uh, grown into full measure of growth in Christ, he humbles himself before God, doing so, and that the Lord uh, humbles him. And in humbling him, when he's already humble, he, this is where he's breaking uh, the spirit, and the soul then becomes a widow. <clears throat> And this is specifically when our adversary appears or shows up on the stage who previously on legal grounds ruled over our body and began to lay claim to the possession of our husband in the form of our body. Our soul in the form of our renewed mind could no longer be ignited by the broken spirit which has humbled itself before God for the purpose of quenching quenching God's hunger and thirst and satisfying God with the fragrance of our broken spirit. It is specifically in this state or at this time that her adversary in the form of her old man begins laying claim to the possession of the widow, he who has previously abol- he who was previously abolished from having power over our body. And then our soul, being a widow, goes to the judge who lived in the same city, but he was not one who feared God or regarded men, and she went to him so that he could protect her from her adversary, laying claim to the possession of her husband. And so what would we read here? Why is he laying claim to the possessions? Because the new man was broken, and when he's broken, then the old man immediately sees this, when a person is in a state of, of brokenness, now the soul can't be ignited by the spirit. The Lord ignites the spirit, and then the soul is ignited, and then the tongue. And suddenly, he feels no one's igniting the soul, and he decided, now I can come out again, and because it used to belong to me. And the soul has become widow, and as she's a widow, I now can restore the relationship I used to have with her and take the possessions, take back uh, the soul and take back the uh, the body, control over the body as well. And then the widow needs to turn to the judge. We ask the question, why did the Israelite widow not go directly to God for her protection, but rather went to this unjust judge, especially since she knew the scriptures and that God is the judge of the widow and the God of the fatherless? 
the answer can somewhat surprise and strike us because during the time of the breaking of our spirit, this unjust judge becomes our tongue because he is no longer ignited by the broken spirit. And this is that third state of our tongue. When our adversary begins to lay claim to our body, our tongue turns into this unjust judge as it can no longer be ignited by our spirit. Again, very important here. When our spirit is is broken, the unjust judge becomes our tongue. Why unjust? Because our tongue can't be ignited from our heart. Why? Because the soul can't be ignited from the from the heart. First, fire is inflamed in my heart, then in my soul, and then in up, upon my tongue. But nothing's igniting. The soul is widowed. And the tongue becomes then this unjust judge. And Brother Kadi says this is this third state of our tongue. This this key word, this third state of our tongue, that tongue by the means of the power of the old man, uh, this third state of our tongue, the first state of our tongue is when we are ignited And the second is when we're ignited from the Holy Spirit. And the third state of our tongue is when we're not ignited by the Spirit. It's broken, and now we need to, by by our will and decision, to save ourselves. And this third state, and this unjust judge, he's unjust because he uses confession of of what we can call a dry information because everything could be as of hell around you. And except for the flames of fire, of hell, a person begins to confess this dry truth that is within his heart. And so these three states of our tongue, some people only have to date the first state of their tongue. They speak uh, ugly things, profanities with their tongue. This is that first state. The second state is when we are ignited by the Holy Spirit. And the third state, this state, is when our spirit is not ignited and our tongue is not ignited from the spirit, but uh, confesses the truth that's already there, that is known. And this third state of our tongue, again, we read, when our adversary begins to lay claim to our body, our tongue turns into this unjust judge as it can no longer be ignited by our spirit. And then our widow makes a case. A very beautiful statement. Our widow makes a case. Our soul makes a case, representing the reasonable aspect of our soul, renewed by the spirit of our mind, and begins to affect him with her faith, affects our tongue. This unjust judge, she affects him with her faith, confessing the rights of her deceased husband to rule over her personal body. Very beautifully stated. The widow makes a case and begins to impact, affect our tongue. It's difficult. There's no fire. But you say, well, confess. Well, I feel dryness around me, but continue to confess. You don't feel fire. You don't feel uh, life. It's as if hell is only around me. But he's saying, confess. Confess the word. Even if you feel all of this, still confess the truth. Although although the absence of the fire of the Holy Spirit who previously during the life of her or our husband ignited or lit up our thoughts, our renewed mind did not become discouraged but took the position of faith by depending on the information of who God is to us in Jesus Christ and what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. And the unjust judge in the form of our tongue, seeing the persistence of our renewed mind, bothering him, who himself was not dependent upon the broken heart, did not fear God or regard men, decided to avenge this widow. This judge decided to avenge this widow. We need to know the indispensable or necessary order God has established when he created us. 
and that we are created in the image and likeness of God and relevant to this order, God protects us exclusively by the means of our tongue. Word spoken by our tongue is the Lord or master for our body and the legitimate instrument for God's help. If we have the faith of God in our heart, but we do not confess it with our tongue, our faith will be our bond servant, and God will never be able to generate anything positive for us using such a bond servant. The faith of the heart that is not confessed with our mouth is the silver buried in the ground, for which we will need to answer before God with all the severity of His holiness, where we will be cast into the eternal darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But the faith of the heart that is confessed with our tongue, even if the tongue is in the state of an unjust judge, when our tongue is not able to be ignited by our broken spirit, this gives God the legitimate ability to protect us from our adversary, laying claim to our possession. In the moment, our spirit is broken and is brought to a state of poverty. It is specifically in this moment, due to the absence of discouragement, that the faith of God takes the stage concealed within our heart in the format of dry information, as we said, of who God is to us in Jesus Christ and what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. This is why there was a necessity for the breaking of our heart. It is to reveal the faith which is concealed within our heart that God searches for so that He can give us the legitimate right to the inheritance of the kingdom of heaven. Only breaking the break, brokenness of our heart will allow God to discover faith in our heart. And if He discovers faith in our heart when our heart is broken, when we confess this dry as dry information, just information that we know when when there's fire around us, uh, then this gives us the legitimate right to the to our inheritance in the kingdom of heaven. When the true fire of the Holy Spirit temporarily stops its activity within our broken spirit so that God can quench his hunger and his thirst, the faith of our heart will always be kept for our soul, making our heart joyful. But in a profane to God fire, when he will be suppressing or he will he will suppress uh he will be suppressed during the destruction of false strongholds of salvation, disappointment will come about in the form of an absence of truth, faith, and faith within the heart. And so certain people have this joy in their heart, but when the strongholds of, of uh, str- these false strongholds are being destroyed in others, it will become disappointment in their heart. And this is because of the absence of truth or faith in the heart. And when a profane fire burning within the heart of man will be condemned by God, then having an absence of faith in the heart, the heart of man will be overtaken with discouragement by the signs of which a person will then inherit eternal hell because he perceived the profane fire as the fire of the Holy Spirit. When the profane fire is dying in the heart, and the Lord will definitely uh, kill this fire, And so how do you determine that you're talking to a wicked person, an evil person, when their fire dims and this person begins to confess the faith of his heart? You will see there's faith. But another who has nothing in his heart, there were strongholds of false, false strongholds of salvation, and he begins to become discouraged, disappointed, and he's beginning to say, I'm I'm perishing. And they then do what uh, Judas did at his time. He became disappointed. God destroyed the the false strongholds and he saw nothing in his heart except disappointment. In this parable, the widow was not discouraged but behaved rather actively because although her spirit was broken, she confessed the faith of God that was being kept in her broken heart. And so we have broken the the false strongholds so that we can establish God's strongholds of true salvation. The faith of God in the heart is myrrh, Apostle Arkady writes, which keeps our broken spirit from the power of sin and corruption. Just like when the nameless woman, representing the broken heart, broke the vessel with myrrh and anointed the body of Jesus. 
this fragrant myrrh representing the faith of God in the heart, she prepared his body for burial. Therefore, when Christ died upon the cross, his body was protected with this fragrant balm from the effects of corruption and decay. To fulfill the prophetic word about Christ, specifically that God will not allow His Holy One to see corruption, God utilized one woman who beforehand anointed the body of Jesus and prepared His body for burial. In addition, the eminent members of the Sanhedrin, Nicodemus and Joseph from Arimathea, the secret disciples of Jesus Christ, brought an expensive balsamic substance of around 100 liters and anointed the body of Jesus due to this fragrant balsamic substance. The body of Jesus was fragrant and the process of decay could not affect his body, his deceased body. In our situation, such a balsamic substance for our broken spirit, as the deceased husband of the widow, is the faith of God, concealed within our heart, and it is for the sake of revealing this faith we have broken our spirit so that we can demonstrate the poverty of our spirit before God so that the Son of Man coming onto our land will discover the faith of our heart. Again, this faith is always, everything uh, <clears throat> is circling faith. Christ first needed to be anointed with oil, this precious myrrh, when... He was alive. This lame, nameless woman anointed him. And when he died, he also needed to be anointed. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, they had the state of the widow. They had this balsamic myrrh. And this myrrh, we need to have also this faith of God that we concealed in our heart. And what's most important, if we cannot, if we do not put place this myrrh uh, while we're alive, when, when, when people die, there's no longer a need to be uh, anointed. This myrrh needs to be placed into our spirit. We need to, during our life, anoint uh, Jesus. We need to place this undamaged truth into our spirit and putting this undamaged truth in our heart and keeping it in its undamaged form. Uh, this is precious myrrh. This, this is very precious information, and we keep it uh, in our living spirit that, and when our spirit is broken we again anoint him first we place the faith there and when the spirit is broken we take the myrrh and begin to confess it we begin to anoint we confess the word so that our spirit not be not have any corruption during the breaking of our spirit our heart becomes joyful daily and we confess our faith with our mouth which is inflamed now not by the fire which during the breaking of our spirit is not able to ignite our thoughts, since God is using this fire at this moment to quench his hunger and his thirst. Here now our tongue is ignited with the fire that the widow had, the fire that she takes from this myrrh. While breaking our spirit, we circumcise our heart for the Lord, And our renewed mind in the form of the widow uses the fragrant balm in the form of the faith of God concealed within our heart. By the means of confessing the faith that is concealed within our heart, God using our judge protect, protects us from the one laying claim to our property, our adversary, and we again receive the legitimate freedom from the power of the old man who tried to use the death of our husband in the form of the broken spirit to lay claim to our body and our soul. By the means of the confession of the faith that is concealed within our heart, we read again, God, using our judge, protects us from the one laying claim to our property. Our, and our adversary, this is our adversary laying claim to our property, and we again receive the legitimate freedom from the power of the old man who tried to use the death of our husband in the form of our broken spirit to lay claim to our body and our soul. how important this is and so until we again are able to receive legitimate freedom from the power of the old man the stronghold of life will not be erected in the place of the stronghold of death for us to legitimately legitimately protect ourselves from the old man we need to utilize not God as our judge 
but use our unjust judge, our tongue, so that we can legitimately deprive ourselves of the old man forever and his power over my soul and our, my body. And so that we, again, for a second time, a deprive him of this power, we need to remember how I initially had broken my relationship with him when I, in the death of the Lord Jesus, died by the law for the law. The old man, this was the first time he lost his power over me in the form of my, my nation, the house of my father, who resists the truth and my personal desires. But he will return a second time when our spirit is broken. We need to legitimately deprive, deprive him of power again. When This is again when our spirit or our heart are, is broken. And then that's when we need to confess what we can call dry faith. This is just information that we know. We don't feel anything and it's just flames around. We, by confessing, we anoint our our man. We, we proclaim that there's no corruption at this time. And for a second time, he then loses the legitimate right. The second time he loses the legitimate right to our soul and our body. Very important. For some, pe- in some people, of course, uh, the old man has not yet lost, f- for the first time, has not yet lost uh, power over the soul and the body. Uh, who people who are ready to kill their brother or sister just uh, because of how they look at them. Or today, the Lord has lifted the plank. Our widow, uh, our soul needs to become a widow twice, and these two. Uh, forms, say, of becoming a widow, this will allow her to fully eliminate the power of the old man. Let us read one of the prayers of David, which was uh, stated during the time of the breaking of the heart, where he says that even though his heart is being broken, he has not forgotten the law of God. Psalm 116.10, I believed, therefore I spoke, I am greatly afflicted. He says, I am greatly afflicted, I believed, therefore I spoke. I confess the faith of my heart in my brokenness. Psalm 119, 169 through 176. Let my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me, give me understanding according to your word. Let my supplication come before you. Deliver me according to your word. My lips shall utter praise. And so he, in his brokenness, he, he begins to, uh, his lips utter praise. He's not ignited by the power of the Holy Spirit. He's just confessing information that he knows. For you teach me your statutes. My tongue shall speak of your word for all your commandments and righteousness. Let your hand become my help, for I have chosen your percepts. I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. Let my soul live, and it shall praise you, and let your judgments help me. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. In conclusion, we see that if the Son of Man coming to earth will not find faith in his heart, he shall strike such an, such an earth with a curse, because a bitter heart cannot keep the fragrant balm of the faith of God in itself, making our heart happy and free from the decay of corruption. And so in what way do we determine that we have this fragrant balm? We will have this upright joy, and upright joy allows us, as in our manifestation, it allows us to stand before the Lord, before His glory, that we don't have any corruption or decay. We have anointed ourselves with this myrrh. The thing is that a bitter heart is a heart whose bonds with the Father are broken. The Father, in this case, represents the messenger of God. And therefore, a person cannot receive protection in the format of a covering of the Most High. It is specifically for this reason the messengers of God in these last days will be clothed into the spirit of Elijah to put into the heart of widows the balm of the faith of God so that they can turn to their unjust judge for their protection from their adversary. As it is written, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the father to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Malachi 4, 5, 6. And so if the Lord comes and does not discover faith, 
then he will be angered and will curse the land. <clears throat> and so the Lord sends his Elijah, his messenger, so that he can place this oil into the heart of the person so that the widow can use this oil. Again, we talk about that two uh, different times. You you are anointed. You anoint your... And so this a nameless woman, if you remember, anointed Jesus Christ. That means our spirit without our soul will not be able to be anointed during our lifetime. When we come to the service as students, when we humble, humble ourselves and our soul is humble and receives the word as a student, at this time we allow this word of God, this oil, this myrrh, to anoint our spirit. Before our spirit is 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 broken, before he dies, uh, he dies uh, and then is uh, as for a second time and then resurrects again. To receive the messenger of God means to honor the son who sent him and clothed him with the spirit of delegated fathership. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are those who put their trust in him. Psalm 2, 11, 12. We need to know that a broken heart is a happy heart of the most beautiful of women and not paying attention to her brokenness the happy heart does good. The broken heart is a happy heart of the most beautiful of women. And we need to have the status of a beautiful, most beautiful of women and not paying attention again to her brokenness. The happy heart does good like medicine, healing all misfortunes. A, a happy, a merry heart does good like medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. Proverbs seventeen twenty two. A broken and humble spirit is the place of the rest and home of God and the food of God, which is upon the golden table, which is within the temple of our body. It is upon this kind of heart that God will look down, and it, it is in this kind of heart that God will live to make alive the spirit that is humble and broken. Isaiah sixty six one two. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the heart, where is the house that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest? For all these things my hand has made and all these things exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. Another place of scripture, Isaiah fifty-seven fifteen. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. And one more place, Psalm 147, 2 through 4. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers together the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He counts the number of the stars. He calls them all by name. And so for whom do these stars shine? People who have this humble and broken heart. And a humble and broken heart is presented in these breads that lay upon the table of showbreads. According to the revelation contained in the 12th chapter of Prophet Daniel, we conclude that in the last days, many who sleep in the dust of the earth will wake up, certain ones for eternal life and others for eternal damnation and shame. But this awakening will occur by completely abolishing the power of the holy nation who have made it to the last days. When an absolute abolishing of the power of the holy nation will happen, that is when this event will take place. In other words, before the people will be saved, specifically the ones that will be found in the book of life to receive their reward, the power of the holy nation needs to be completely abolished who have, who have reached the last days. In its significance and in its greatness, 
this will be the greatest victory over the powers of hell and death, because at this time, in the moment of complete or total abolishing, God will utilize and will show both the crushing and the fragrant power of his word in the form of the faith of our heart. What state the saints need to be in here? A complete abolishing of the power of the holy nation needs to occur. And this will allow the crushing and the fragrant power of the word of God to be seen. How important uh, will be this state in the saints? And this victory will become possible due to their broken spirit, where God, using the faith that is concealed within the heart of man, with a broken spirit, will demonstrate the glory of eternal life when he will clothe those who have awakened from the dust into their eternal heavenly home, and those who are still alive he will transform from an earthly home into a heavenly home within the blink of an eye. And so to achieve this victory, to awaken those that today are in their tombs and to give them their new bodies and those saints that were still alive at this time are still alive at this time to give them the glorious heavenly bodies we need to have this state the state of absolute and complete broken uh, breaking of the power we have to have the brokenness of our spirit because having this broken spirit will activate God and will allow him to demonstrate his crushing and fragrant uh, power such power that the tombs will open and the saints will, uh, the graves will open and the and the people will come out of them and our bodies will be transformed. If during the breaking of our spirit there will be an absence of disappointment and you will at this time have a joyful heart which contains the commandments of the Lord, you possess the result by which you can examine yourself as to whether you walk with God and in this way demonstrate the great boldness that is within your faith. This is what the Son of Man will search for in the last times, when the time of the harvest comes, identified as the time of vengeance in the fruit of the kingdom of heaven, grown by us from the seed of the kingdom of heaven. Mark 4, 30-32 Then Jesus said, To what shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what parable shall we picture it? It is like a mustard seed, which when it is sown on the ground, is smaller than all the seeds on the earth. But when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all herbs and shoots out large branches so that the birds of the air may nest under its shade. Therefore, the mustard seed is a symbol of the seed of the kingdom of heaven, which is sown into the good soil of the human heart. As it is written, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Romans 14, 17, 18. According to the given statement, the fruit of the kingdom of heaven that is grown in the good soil of the human heart from the seed of the kingdom of heaven in the image of the mustard seed consists in the virtue of righteousness, peace, and joy, which are able to be demonstrated exclusively if they are being grown in the soil of the human heart. The birds of the air who cover in the large branches of the grown kingdom of heaven within our heart in the form of righteousness and peace and joy is the revelation of the Holy Spirit that is revealed to us in the form of the oath promises of God, representing the pure and imperishable inheritance within our heart in Jesus Christ. And so what you could bring about from a mustard seed, such a tree that the birds of the air will will then find shade in these branches. If the mustard seed of faith in the form of the kingdom of heaven, identifying the seed of justification in the format of the given to us guarantee, will not be sown into the good soil of our human heart, we will never be able to become possessors of the fruit of righteousness in the form of the born to us Methuselah, which is perceived as the faith of God within our broken heart, which is called to by the tongue of our unjust judge to destroy and break all of the foundations of hell and death so that we can be clothed into our heavenly home and after be moved to heaven 
bypassing death expecting all mankind. Therefore, to possess the virtue of a widow who activates the help of God by confessing the faith of her heart with her tongue, representing the image of the unjust judge, is to command your fig tree to be uprooted from the soil of your heart and be planted into the sea of your reasonable abilities. Very interesting parable. So the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Luke 17, 6. And so we are determining here in what way we need to examine whether we have this, uh, <clears throat> or we have faith as a mustard seed. And so if our faith is not as this mustard seed, and so those promises, these uh, birds of heaven or these, they will not be able to hide in them. And so we need to determine if we have the legitimate right to these promises. Our faith needs to be as the mustard seed. And so we are examining whether our faith is able to take by right these promises and confess them as a reality. The scriptures say, if you tell, the fig tree within our heart is the faith of God. To uproot it from the soil of our heart and to replant it in the sea of reasonable abilities means to renew your mind with the spirit of your mind. And so we're examining this mustard seed. If we plant it, it... It, it's the smallest one, but once it, it grows up, it is one of the largest of trees. And we see that this mustard seed can move us from one area to another. It can move us from the good soil of our heart and be replanted into the sea. What is the sea? The sea is the reasonable abilities of our soul. And so when we take this faith that is clean, that's undamaged teaching of Jesus Christ that came in the flesh, this is this mustard seed, and we place it there, then the Lord uh, then can determine that he can take the promise that lies at the door of hope that he determines that what's in the heart uh, will be able to renew our soul or our mind. You could take it, uproot it, and put it in the sea, sea of your uh, reasonable abilities and renew your mind and then confess this faith with your mouth. If we can do this, then we have this mustard seed. How many people today have such faith? If you look around, the churches churches begin with anecdotes. They, they talk about different things in their life stories. And every time they tell the story, there are new false or uh, unreal elements of the story. And so, but when we receive pure information, pure information is determined uh, by us being able to, for a second time, deprive power of the old man over our body and our soul. And this faith can do this, that is, in, as this mustard seed. The ability to uproot it from your heart into your, your mind and from your mind then to your, to your lips, your mouth, to confess. Only with a mind that is renewed by the spirit of our mind, when the faith of our heart is moved into our renewed mind, does the lamp of our broken heart continue to burn brightly even in the nighttime. In other words, she took this fire and put this fire into her soul. This fire is now expanding onto the soul. Because when you have a fire, you need to watch after the fire. And who will watch over our renewed mind? Our widow. Which will allow the Son of Man at the time of, of the harvest, Apostle Arkady writes, to find the faith of God within our heart by the means of which he will clothe our earthly bodies into our heavenly home. Only a person who has grown the fruit of righteousness in the form of the born to him Methuselah in the Eden of his heart is able to fit the state of a broken heart. Uh, 
And so if while examining yourself and searching yourself, whether you are in the faith, you discover disappointment and dissatisfaction of who God is for you in Jesus Christ and what God has done for you in Jesus Christ. This will be the be the arrogance of your heart, Apostle Arkady writes, where there is an absence of upright joy and fear before the word of God, which you apply not to, for yourself, but for those around you. Again, a word that you don't apply to yourself, you hear it, but you apply it not to yourself, but those around you. This disappointment will be in such pe- such people, people who don't apply it to themselves. They will have the absence of upright joy. Shudder and immediately humble yourself under the strong arm of God, so that God not be obligated to humble you, because disappointment, which occurs within your heart, was provoked by you yourself, by your reaction or your behavior when listening to the Word of God. If your heart fears from the preach to your word, and you, out of love for God, break your heart and rejoice when overcoming sorrow for the truth, then this means that you walk before God and you walk and your walk is fragrance before God. And so glory to God, let us thank God for the revelation that we were able to receive and hear today. It is the possession of our heart and not just this revelation. If the revelation is in our heart, then upright joy is also there. Let us pray and thank God. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for the great privilege of being in this place that your hand has appointed for the worshiping of your holy name. We thank you, Lord, that upon this place is the remembrance of your holy name. Because, Lord, this place has the virtue of the narrow gates. It is this virtuous or good wife. You have allowed us to be an organic member of your body. And today, Lord, we thank you for the word that you have passed on to us as your precious balm, as your precious myrrh, that, Lord, today we receive into our heart. We receive it into our heart so that this precious myrrh and precious balm would be able to today anoint our spirit and prepare it for it being broken before your holy face. And when our spirit is broken, because of the truth that we have put into our heart and because the truth that we use to renew our mind and we confess because of this truth, we will confess the faith of our heart and we will confess this fragrant myrrh so that in our spirit and in our, not in, and so in our spirit, our body or soul, there would not be a corruption. We thank you, Lord, that when you, You have submerged our soul into the death of the Lord Jesus Christ when we died by the law to the law. You have deprived the old man of the legal right over our body and our soul. But you bring us to a moment where you for the second time and and this time final time, you will deprive the old man of the the legal right to our soul that will no longer be uh, corrupt and our body that will not be corrupt and to receive the status and to legally deprive him of power permanently, you want our lips to become your judge. And for our lips to be your judge, we need to first need to be ignited by your Holy Spirit. Your word needs to be within our spirit, within our mind, and it needs to be upon our lips. But, Lord, when our spirit will be broken, our unjust judge, unrighteous judge, unjust judge will continue to confess that very same faith of God, regardless of what's going on, not looking at all the changes that are occurring around you. Inside, we continue to be immovable. Although everything that can speak against us and we sense hell, 
outside of us, but inside. We see your life, your resurrection inside of our spirit. There's no corruption. In our spirit, there's no disappointment. You have allowed us today to be anointed with your oil and to receive the opportunity to stand before your glory upright in exceeding joy. Thank you for this great privilege that you've passed on to us today, this precious myrrh by your messenger, our pastor and apostle, Brother Akadi. We thank you, Lord, for these great mysteries, for this beauty, for this might, for these precious promises, this truth that has become the possession of our heart, has become the possession of a renewed mind and our lips. And we thank you, Lord, that those revelations that have already become the possession of our heart and the heart of our pastor, that they be spoken by him and that he pass on these revelations uh, by his by the preached word so that we can hear these revelations because, Lord, faith is not from reading. Faith is from hearing when you speak using your person and we are ready to hear this word. We prepare our heart to accept this precious myrrh that we anoint ourselves with that and in this way deprive hell and death of power in our soul and our body and Lord we thank you for the adoption we thank you for that faith we've received into our heart the branches of this faith in these branches the birds can hide and we thank you Lord that you have revealed to us your oath promises and you have shown that the multitude of these promises we already have but some of them still need to happen soon and for them to happen soon you can't make them happen or come about without man you want man to demonstrate faithfulness to your word and that He no longer be ignited by you, but that we ignite by quenching your hunger and thirst. You want to be satisfied with your word, with your mighty word that we will confess with our mouth. And we thank you, Lord, that today you have placed your throne, not just in our spirit, you've placed it in our soul, in our renewed mind. And today you place your throne in our gentle or meek tongue, that today is ignited and not by hell but the Holy Spirit Lord when our spirit will be broken your godly fire will continue to be confessed with our mouth as the faith of our heart you had said in your word by Jeremiah that in the last days you will do something on earth the wife will she not save her husband You want the soul of man, the soul of a Christian that has become a widow, that it can save her husband. Thank you, Lord, that you will do do something new in this last times. And when this happens, you will give the command that the dead rise and those who are alive put on their new man, created according to God in true righteousness and holy truth. Thank you, Lord, for this truth. Thank you for the Church of Christ, and may it be blessed before your holy face, and may all of the works of the devil be cursed and destroyed, because not hell or death or the old man have any legitimate right to our body or our soul. Corruption is not our inheritance. We thank you, Lord, that our inheritance is the imperishable and immortal. And we thank you, Lord, that you will allow your church to bypass the death that expects all men. We have accepted this revelation and we keep it within our heart. Our great God, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, 
your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and power and glory forever. Amen. Let us finish with our manifestation. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior who alone is wise be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. <laughs> 